so exciting to be here and really finishing all of Sedumud is such a huge achievement and it's a joy to be here with you tonight. And I want to focus on something that stands at the in the backdrop of all of Sedumud. And I think for us as people living Jewish life in the 21st century, it's something that seems very obvious and trivial. But actually, when we go back, we can notice that one of the greatest revolutions that Chazal brought into, uh, into Jewish life was a revolution that had to do with Seder Moed and with Jewish time. So if we look back to the biblical worldview and we think about where sanctity is found in the biblical world, then there's actually three different vectors of sanctity. One is the sanctity of time, where we see Shabbat, you know, interrupting um, the week and giving a break to people, and obviously against the backdrop of uh, Egypt and of the ancient world in general, this was one of the greatest revolutions of the Bible. But also the Chagim, also the, the cyclical time, um, the cyclical year and the week that a person is actually living their life all the time in reference to holy time. But we also have two additional vectors. We have the sanctity of space, right? The, at the, the way that space is organized in the biblical books is in a circular way with the Mishkan and afterwards the Mikdash at the center. And the sanctity of the Mishkan or afterwards the Mikdash emanates out so that, um, so that Jerusalem has sanctity and afterwards uh, all of the land of Israel has a certain degree of sanctity. So that's the second vector. And the third vector is the vector of the sanctity of the person or sancti human sanctity, which has to do with the different levels of sanctity that First of all, Am Yisrael is considered a Mamlechet Kohanim Vigoy Kadosh. And even within the people of Israel, then we have the Kedusha of the Levim and we have the Kedusha of the Kohanim. And these three vectors intersect on the one day that uh, typifies most the biblical idea of sanctity, which is the day of Yom Kippur, when the most sacred person, the Kohen Gadol, goes into the most sacred place, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, on the most sacred day of the year. So we have the person, the place, and the time all intersecting. But I want to ask the question of what's going on with everybody else, right? When we think about Yom Kippur, and in general, more broadly, the festivals in the biblical worldview, well, everybody else is pretty passive. All of the sacred work that is done, not, I'm not talking about Shabbat now, but I'm talking about the, the various Mo'adim, it's all concentrated in the temple. It's not only on Yom Kippur, but also on Sukkot or on Pesach, in general, the Regalim, perhaps also Rosh Hashanah, although this isn't as clear, and certainly Yom Kippur. So the temple is very, very central to the biblical view of the festivals, while what happens everywhere else is not really described so much or not described as something that is central to, um, to, the, to the Chagim. Now, the Tanakh itself already juxtaposes the sanctity of place, the Mishkan, with the sanctity of Shabbat. And we saw in Masechet Shabbat that the rabbis derive from this that the building of the Mishkan actually takes a back seat to the observance of Shabbat. And the sanctity of time in the worldview of the rabbis trumps the sanctity of space. And I think that this is not, it's not by coincidence because the rabbis were actually living in a reality which didn't have that temple at the core that vector of the sanctity of space had been dropped out from under their feet. Um, and they had to cope and think about what do they do with that? How do they 
create a reality that will preserve sanctity without the temple. And so we see this all over Masechet Moed, but I want to focus for a moment on the takanot that the decrees that were instituted by Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai and are described in the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah. And there we hear about a variety of um, decrees and also we hear about Rabban Yochanan's other decrees and other places in the Mishnah, but I wanna focus on three that have to do with the Chagim. First of all, the Mishnah says that uh, in the time of the temple, then the Tki'ab shofar would happen in, um, in the temple. And Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai instituted after the destruction of the temple that the Tki'ab shofar should take place outside of the temple as well, particularly in a place where there was a, a, a Beit Din. Another decree was that the lulav, the lulav that had been a central part of the ceremony in the Mikdash during Sukkot, also should be instituted for seven days, not only in the temple, but also outside of the temple. And there the Mishnah explicitly says that this is in memory of um, the period of the temple. And I want to adduce another example, another case, another takana um, described elsewhere, where Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai instituted the takana that the Kohanim should bless the people not only in the Mikdash, but also in the synagogue. So we see that through all of these takanot, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai is responding to the destruction of the temple in contrast to some of his colleagues who said, you know, now there's no temple, we can't drink wine anymore, we can't eat meat anymore, we just have to mourn. Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, in contrast, is very practical. And he says, let's take these practices that were part of temple life and we'll expand them and make them the basis of Jewish ritual outside of the temple. And he does this by strengthening the institutions of the Beit Din and the institution of the synagogue, but also the institution of the home. Because when he says that people should litol uh, lulav in their sukkah or in their home, that's an individual action. So the real revolution of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai is, was to have the wisdom to take the temple practices and the different vectors that intersected in the biblical worldview and expand them out so that they would be relevant for each individual and to create a new form of Jewish life where we remember the temple through many of the rituals that we practice, but they also have the opportunity to gain new meaning, whether in the synagogue, whether in the institutional structure of the Jewish community, or through the Jewish home. And so our festivals and our festival cycle become part of a new Jewish ritual that is, has ties to the old, has ties to the past, but can also um, expand its sanctity by taking on new meanings and new understandings um, of, of ritual and of the cyclical uh, forms of Jewish life that are created through uh, abiding to these chagim. Mazal tov to everyone and good luck on the next part of the journey.